Welcome to this lecture on PID control loops. Today we're going to be programming a PID ladder logic instruction. We're going to set it up accordingly. We're going to also simulate this within a trends on a live PLC. And we're going to look at the effects that different parameters within the PID loop instruction have on the control set point of set parameters. So without any further delay, let's get right into it. Before we get started with today's video, we just wanted to quickly point out all the great content we've been releasing on the Solus PLC YouTube channel. And this includes industrial automation, PLC programming, as well as HMI development. And if you enjoy this type of content, we would really appreciate it if you could click the subscribe button as well as the notification bell in order to receive the latest and greatest content we will be posting to the channel. So to get started, we're going to create a new routine. I'm going to go into my advanced section and I'm going to right click, hit on add new routine. And this is going to be a ladder logic diagram routine. So I'm just going to type in the next prefix and I'm going to call it PID loop. Nothing extremely difficult. I'm going to click OK. And as you can see, the new routine has been created. We're going to need a couple of things in order to get the PID to work. Of course, we are first going to use an instruction. So I'm just going to pull any instructions from this bar and then rename it to PID. This will bring up the PID ins instruction as you would expect with a lot of undefined parameters. So we're going to start populating them at this point. The PID loop, first of all, this is going to be the control structure, which is going to be used for the PID. And I'm simply going to call that PID. I already used a PID underscore tutorial, so I'm just going to call it PID1. And here we're going to need to create some process variables. So the process variable, think of this as your input to the PID loop. So we're going to just create a quote unquote dummy rung, which is going to give us some more visual on the PID loop. So here we're going to say this is some kind of a temperature sensor, which is giving us a feedback from a physical device. So think of this as an analog input, which we're receiving into our system. And this is going to go into PID one underscore PV. And this PID one underscore PV is just a real tag. So that's going to be Create it like so and I'm going to create a new temperature sensor real value as well. This is like I said, just for demonstration purposes in the real system, you would have a temperature sensor, which comes in on an analog card. And we'll look at that in a different video. So in any case, that's going to be our temperature sensor at this point It's going to be zero. But here the process value is going to be PID one underscore PV. It's usually good practice to set these up as separate tags because you might be using the temperature sensor for different applications within your software. So usually you'd want to create some kind of a move structure which allows you to output this. And then the next step is going to be the tieback. This is not something that um, is used very frequently. So I'm just going to put that in. It's going to be a real tag. I don't usually use the tieback for anything. So it just kind of sits there and calculates control value. We're going to create that tag as well. So PID one underscore control variable. And the control value variable is essentially going to be the output of your instruction. The control variable is going to be what you're going to output to the outside world in order to control the uh, the process. And here we're going to create a second move instruction. So think of this as the control variable. And you can use the output of the PID instruction as well. So there's going to be an output and percentage, there's going to be a process variable. And of course, the control variable is where we would like to go. So let's see here, this is going to be heating system. And this is just going to make it easier for us to visualize what is going on. I'm going to right click, click this, create a new and then real hit. Yes. Next PID master loop. We don't have a master. This is a standalone PID, but you can certainly have PIDs which depend on each other and hold in hold is going to be zero. And here we have question marks because our control value has not been initialized. So I'm going to right click this hit on new. And this is going to be of data type PID. This is a an Alan Bradley specific module. So we are 
going to create that and that's pretty much it as far as just the basic configuration goes the other thing that we do need to look at is the parameters but actually before that let's create the timer which is going to be updating our loop so here i'm going to create a t on instruction t on and this is going to be called PID one underscore T. We already have that tag in place and I'm going to update it every 50 milliseconds. Let's leave it at that. And the timer is going to cycle on itself. So I'm going to use a an XIO instruction, which essentially going to be tied to my done bit. So think of this as a repeating timer. And then once the timer is done, I want my PID loop to update. And then that looks pretty good. So here's what we need to configure or the critical values. So of course the gains, we're going to look at those in just a second, but within this configuration tab, there's going to be a few parameters. This is going to be an independent loop. The error, so the control action is going to be the set point minus the uh, process variable. That's correct. The derivative of PV. So depending on what kind of a loop you're running you may play with those but usually the default values work pretty well the loop update timer is very important this is going to have to match the timer so this is in seconds and here the value is in microseconds so we're going to set that to 0 0.05 the limit so the high limit is going to be 100 let's set that as such the low limit is zero alarms we're not going to play with these but you can essentially create alarms for your pids as well in terms of scaling, we need to scale our values. So on scale, there's going to be a thousand. Max at 100% is going to be, let's say 1000, or actually let's, let's make this 100, 100, and then the engineering units max 1000 as well here. So we're going to hit apply on everything. And then we should be ready to essentially work with these gains Oh, uh, and we're going to be changing the set point, of course. I'm going to hit OK. The next thing that we also need to do is we need to simulate. So the loop on a PLC, which is running on its own, is not going to get the values that I've described above. So essentially, we do need to, instead of doing this, I'm going to actually put an AFI here. Instead of doing this, which should be the way that you work with the PID instruction, I'm going to create a timer, which is going to, sorry, a compute instruction, which is going to simulate, which is going to simulate the PID action. So let's look at that right now. It's also going to update every single time that the timer is done. The destination is going to be our process variable. So think of this as essentially a way to trick the PID loop to show a how it's running in a real world application. So this is going to be multiplied by 0 0.99. So essentially, it's always getting closer, but not quite. And here we're going to add the control variable multiplied by 0 0.01. And we're going to save all of this. Let's see if we can save this without without any errors the last thing since you can tell that the rung is not energized we need to go back into our main and call this instruction essentially create a jump to subroutine so i'm going to copy one of the rungs above paste it down below and here i'm going to call the instruction routine which we've just created which is going to be underscore zero five underscore pid loop and i'm going to update this once again and i'm going to double click the pid loop and double check what is going on. So since we have a zero set point, you will notice that the process variable is going to slowly go down, but I am going to put this at, let's say 100, and then we haven't set any parameters. So let's just give it some random values of fives, for example. Let's hit on apply and let's hit okay. So the process variable, as you can see, the output is currently 100% and the process variable is trending towards the set point and of course if i increase this then you'll notice that the process variable is slowly going to trend in that direction i believe that we do need to adjust the scaling the process variable 1000 1000 let's see here 
let's set let's set that at 1000 as well and as you will notice it overshot but then it comes back so let's create a trend which is going to demonstrate this functionality and in order to do this first of all we're going to right click on trends i already have another trend set up but i'm going to call this underscore zero two underscore pid one I'm going to update that every single millisecond. I'm going to click next. Here we're going to select some key tags at which we're going to look. So from the drop down menu, we need to browse down to PID one. And within this PID one, we want to look at two different things. So first of all, I do want to look at the set point. Set point. We're going to click add. And I also want to look at the process variable so the process variable is how close we are to the to the actual set point so let's see here it should be pv somewhere here sp they're not in uh, alphabetical order so it's a little bit confusing sometimes those are going to be the two tags that we're going to look at let's click on finish and before we run i'm going to right click and go into chart properties and from here, I'm going to go into my pens. And instead of leaving them from 0 to 100, I'm going to type in 1,000, 1,000. This is essentially to allow us to see the full range of both of those pens. The x-axis, I'm going to just change this to 10 seconds. So we're going to have a span of 10 seconds within our trend. I'm going to hit apply. The other thing that I also want to change, let's see here. So this is the major grid lines here so let's just add some more grid lines so it could be a bit more apparent what's going on and then the y-axis instead of using the automatic scaling we're going to select this preset which is going to use the min and the max values that you remember we set from 0 to 1000 for both of those pens i'm going to hit apply hit this ok button and from this point i can hit the run button and you will notice that both values are exactly the same they are currently at 300 and the reason for that is because, first of all, those are the values specified by the PID loop. But that means essentially that the PID loop ha has worked as expected. Let's change the set point to 600 and then tab, control tab back into the PID trend and see what happens. This is the, the wrong trend. Let me see. Let's, um, let's close a few windows. I'm just going to close this. Apply to edits, we're going to say yes. And then continue closing the trend. We're going to close a few trends and then I'm going to rerun just this trend and then reopen this PID loop. So let's go back and then hit run once again. The PID loop is definitely running. As you can see, both of the values are at 600. And now let's change this value down to 200, for example. And I'm going to tab back into the window and you will notice that the PID loop immediately starts to react and trend towards the set point, which is exactly the behavior that you would expect and that you would want in a normal control system. As you see here, it overshot or essentially undershot below the set point, then it slightly oscillates on top of it and then it comes back into the value, which is the normal behavior of the loop and of course once you have set this up you can start playing with the proportional integral and derivative gains these are going to highly depend on your application and of course if you start changing them to different values you will see different results based on the gains and here the gains are going to highly depend on the values of the simulation the way we set it up but you can certainly, once you implement this and get some starting points into your control loop, you can figure out which values would work best for your application. So let's go back and change the set point to 500 now that we've played with some of those values and see how it reacts this time. So as you can see, we have a slightly faster trend upwards, but we're not quite getting into the set point as fast as we did last time. So since I reduced the integral and the derivative gains, we are certainly taking a much longer time. And as you can see, this would not be an ideal application for this particular loop. That being said, if we over increase them, so for example, let's put in a value of 20. Let's hit on apply and then let's wait for the loop to settle down just a little bit. And then we're going to put in 200 just like we did before. And then we tab back to our system. You will notice what happens is that the loop will typically 
undershoot and then oscillate for a little bit longer. So it's going to oscillate, then it's going to oscillate back and it's going to eventually settle. But essentially it oscillates a little bit more than it did in the previous scenario. And of course, if we play with the proportional gain, let's set it to one, for example, and then go to a set point of 500 once again, then you will notice that we're trending quite a bit faster, but we are overshooting a lot more in this case. And this is going to be somewhat of a trial and error depending on your system. It's not always a precise science. There's of course some reasoning to it. Usually you start with a single proportional gain and then you introduce integral and derivative gains, but it's not something that you could essentially reapply from system to system, especially if they're, com if they're completely different, if you're controlling flows, if you're controlling temperatures. It also depends on the responsiveness of your time. So for example, if you have a temperature sensor, which takes, I don't know, 10 minutes to get the real temperature because of the propagation and the delays within the insulation, then of course it's going to react different than a flow meter, for example, which is filling a tank, which reads a real time data. So there's going to be a lot of different parameters, but once you set this up, you can essentially start playing with the control loop that you have developed. And this is a really good way to practice and see what kind of different effects these parameters have on a control loop. So I highly encourage you to build this instruction just like I did and see what kind of results you get. As you can see here, once again, this loop is not reacting fast enough and it's certainly not going to get to the set point as quickly as we would like. But there's always trade-offs and depending on the systems, it may, may work for your applications. Thank you guys so much for watching my content. If you have any questions on this topic, make sure to leave them in the comment section below. And if you can spend five seconds of your time liking as well as sharing that video, if you've enjoyed it, that would mean absolutely the world to me. And if you have any suggestions for the channel, what kind of hardware software I should be covering, then make sure to leave that down there as well. See you next time. Take care. Bye.